Mark chapter 5 is, is where we're headed today as we continue looking through some of these stories from the Gospel of Mark that we've been doing for a couple of weeks now. Now, as you're turning there, I'll just share, when I was a, a young kid, uh, I was pretty odd uh, in, in a lot of ways. I did not like getting messy. I could not stand it. Even when I was really little, I did not like getting messy. At, at mealtimes, um, I, I kept a clean face. Uh, I kept uh, clean hands as much as I could. Uh, my, my stepmother often recalls how strange she thought it was. She'd, she'd never seen a kid not just, you know, face plant and whatever they happened to be eating at the time. And, and I just could not stand that as a kid. I, I don't know what it was, but, but, you know, this continued on. I mean, I remember in the summertime, I didn't really like going to the beach very much because the sand would kind of get all over you and the salt water was really sticky and I didn't like that. And, and even, even to this day, there are parts of this that, that are still true. Last month in December, there was one night when I decided that I wanted gingerbread cookies. And so um, I, I didn't, you know, tell Caitlin to, to make gingerbread cookies. I said, I'm going to make gingerbread cookies myself. And so I set out to put all the res you know, ingredients together, mix it all. And for the most part, I used a spoon. Uh, but there came a moment where I really needed to just kind of psych myself up and dig in. Uh, because you got to, you know, put, put the dough together. You got to knead it a little. You got to roll it out and then use the cookie cutters and, and all of that. Um, if you saw, I did post a picture of this on Facebook last month. I made some dinosaur uh, gingerbread. Uh, not gingerbread men, gingerbread dinosaurs. Um, it, it was great. They were very tasty. Um, but, you know, I had to get my hands messy. And, and, you know, that was part of the job. But I, again, was very quick to go wash them and clean them off because I just don't love that. Now, maybe some of you can relate to this. You just don't like getting messy or sticky or, or any of that things. But others of you might love that, right? You, you, you might love, you know, getting your hands a little dirty, whether it's digging into a garden and, and, and doing that stuff, or maybe it's some sort of an art or, or a craft. You, you love this, right? You love getting some sort of dirt or paint under your fingernails. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we've got folks here on, on, on sort of each end of this spectrum. But here's the deal, right? Whether you prefer to stay tidy, like little childhood me, uh, or you like to get a little messy, I'm really grateful that Jesus is not like me. I'm really grateful that, that Jesus is a dirt under the fingernails kind of person. Because our God is a dirt under the fingernails kind of God. This is who God is. Like, I love the description of God even all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. When he creates humanity, God doesn't stay far off and keep his distance. It says that he reaches down and forms humanity out of the dirt. And just like a sculptor, right, he, he forms humankind and just like a sculpture, we bear his fingerprints. This is one of the defining characteristics of God. God does not keep his distance from humanity, but constantly pursues, constantly runs after. And we see this most clearly whenever God actually took on flesh in Jesus who came to dwell among us. And Jesus continues this pursuit, getting his hands a little dirty. This is what we've seen so far over the past couple of weeks as we've been looking through the Gospel of Mark. All right, at the very start, at Jesus' baptism, we see the heavens torn open. It's the statement saying, God is near, right? Heaven is open. This is what Jesus comes to proclaim. And then right after that, he begins calling people to follow him. You, you see Simon and Andrew. You see James and John. Jesus begins to call people together into community. He reaches out and he says, I'm going to make you fishers of people. I'm going to send you out as well. Right? And, and then last week, we saw Jesus continue this pursuit in his interaction with the leper right? Right? Again, we, we saw that Jesus is not afraid of getting messy. He reaches out, and Jesus touched this man's diseased skin. 
And that skin, that man is made clean. This is who Jesus is. And so today in Mark chapter 5, we're going to continue see, seeing Jesus confront the unclean and bring about transformation. So let's read this together. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, Jesus, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine. Let us enter them. And so he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine and the herd. Numbering about 2,000, all rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. And the swineherds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion. And they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. And then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who pursues us. A God who is not afraid of getting dirt under your fingernails. God, I pray that as we consider the words of the scripture, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I've mentioned before that Mark is usually very succinct. Mark is usually pretty quick. I mean, the gospel as a whole moves on at this really quick pace with these little brief bullet point stories. It's much shorter than Matthew. It's much shorter than Luke or or John. And it's not usually nearly as descriptive as, as we find some of the other gospel accounts to be. But this story is an exception. This story is also told by Matthew. It's also told by Luke. But they are not nearly as detailed as Mark is here. Right? Luke's version of the story is, is 14 verses long. Matthew's is only seven. But Mark takes 20 verses 
to share this story, expounding in detail. I mean, Mark gives us a full character profile of this man, right? From the misery of his life to the majesty of his transformation. There are a lot of incredible transformations that occur throughout the Gospels, but this one in particular is pretty astounding. I mean, he goes from living in the tombs and beating himself with stones in verses 2 and 4 to verse 15. He's peacefully seated, dressed, and it says, in his right mind. Right? He goes from shouting at Jesus in verse 7 to proclaiming Jesus in verse 20. Right? This is a startling transformation that we see. So I want to look through this story and, and kind of look at some of the background info of it, and then look at the, the actual interaction that happens between Jesus and this man. And finally, a couple of surprising responses that we see towards the end. So first, just some of the background of this story. I mean, it's a startling transformation, but there are some other elements in the story that are perhaps even more startling. You see, just like last week, with the leper. This story is about how Jesus approaches things that are unclean. Jesus approaches unclean things. We can hear that in how Mark describes this man. In verse 2, he is one with an unclean spirit. Now, when, when Matthew and Luke tell this story, they simply say that, that this is someone who has a, a demon, right? Someone who's possessed with a demon. But Mark describes him as a man with an unclean spirit. There is a theme that Mark is trying to emphasize. We saw this when the leper who came for cleansing, we see this here uh, with, with this unclean spirit and this man who is also cleansed. And this is only one of several unclean elements that we see throughout this story. Remember last week, I mentioned that Leviticus is a great companion book to the Gospel of Mark. It really helps you understand a little bit more of what's going on behind the scenes. And so I just want to look at, at a couple of these things. We see this here, a few different elements. First, look at where Jesus goes. Right, this is the very first verse. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, the country of the Gerasenes. Now, down at the end in verse 20, we learn that this is part of an area that's called the Decapolis, which means ten cities. The Decapolis. Now, the, the Decapolis was a region consisting of ten cities, and those cities were under Roman rule and, and largely had a dense Roman population. And so for Jewish people, the Decapolis was the other side of the tracks. The Decapolis is where you, you don't go there. I mean, it quite literally, is the other side of the sea. To the west, you have places like Nazareth and Galilee. You have Jerusalem and Judea, right? These, these are classic, prominent Jewish places. But on the other side of the sea, to the east, you have the Decapolis, the land of the Gentiles. And Leviticus makes it very clear that Jews are not supposed to be associated with Gentiles, right? They're supposed to be set apart from the nations. They are special people. They're consecrated. And yet here, uh, we see Jesus heading right toward this Gentile territory. In Leviticus, leaving the, the, the sort of promised land is, a, is an act of curse, right? It's, it's, it's a punishment for disobedience in some ways, but here, Jesus leaves that promised land territory, and it turns into a blessing. He approaches a place that would have been considered unclean. Jesus is doing this on purpose, right? Where he's going. Now, now look, uh, another element here. Look at where this man who comes up to Jesus is coming from. 
We, we see this in verse 2. It says, When Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. See, this man is coming to Jesus from out of the tombs. And another thing that we read in Leviticus is that anyone who comes into contact with a dead body is considered unclean. It's further elaborated in the book of Numbers that anyone who comes in contact with a dead body has to go into a seven-day quarantine. And in the midst of that, they, they have a special washing that they have to do with water. For seven days, this person is considered unclean, right? Just like the leper that we read about last week. And that's just for coming into contact with a dead body. I mean, this guy lived in the tombs, right? I mean, he's got dead bodies for roommates and next-door neighbors, so again, we see this unclean person approaching Jesus, which puts Jesus in jeopardy of also becoming unclean. And yet Jesus doesn't flinch, right? Jesus is there for a reason. And so the, the place is the unclean land of the Gentiles. This man comes out of the unclean tombs. And there's one more thing. Leviticus 11 describes a number of kind of animals and foods that are considered unclean. And chief among them are pigs. Specifically describes pigs as being unclean. You know, don't go near them, don't touch them. Well, guess what? This place is crawling with pigs. I mean, verses 11 and 13 tell us there is a great herd of about 2,000 nearby. That's a lot of pigs. That's a lot of pigs. I mean, man, what did that place smell like? All of these details are here on purpose. Mark is making his point abundantly clear. Jesus comes to the unclean land of the Gentiles, infested with unclean pigs, where he's approached by an unclean man with an unclean spirit. Any one of these things would be enough to give a pious Jewish person nightmares. But this is where Jesus goes. Right? This is who Jesus interacts with. And just look. Look at what happens. So look at the interaction that happens here in verse 6. The unclean man with an unclean spirit comes right up to Jesus. What does he do? He bows down before him. You see, all that is unclean cowers before Jesus. All that is unclean trembles at his name. This man shouts out, what have you to do with me? Do not torment me. Right? And this just shows us the power of Jesus. And I think in many ways it reiterates what we learned last week. Remember how last week we, we kind of uh, explored some of this psychology of disgust. And one of the aspects of that that we talked about is something called negativity dominance. All right? It, it only takes a little bit of a negative thing to make a positive thing polluted and disgusting. Right? This is just how the logic of disgust works. The, the example we considered last week uh, was that a drop of urine and a bottle of wine makes the whole bottle undrinkable. You're not going to touch that. Right? You're not going to go near to that. Negativity dominance is the rule of disgust. It's, it's part of this logic of disgust. But Jesus reverses this logic, right? Jesus reverses this. Last week, we saw that Jesus comes into contact with a leper, and it was not Jesus who became unclean, but rather the leper who became clean, right? Jesus operates in a completely different way that we might call positivity dominance. This is how Jesus 
is. And we see it at work again here in Mark chapter 5. And I already mentioned that a pious Jewish person would never go mingle with the unclean Gentiles or go near an unclean animal like a pig or be close to an unclean person like this man from the tombs and wouldn't even dream of confronting an unclean spirit. They wouldn't do any of those things for fear of becoming unclean themselves. But here, it is not Jesus who fears becoming unclean. Rather, it's the unclean spirit who's afraid. Because with Jesus, the rule is positivity dominance. Jesus has power over unclean things. Jesus is the one with the power. And you see, Jesus is not threatened by our uncleanness. It's our uncleanness that's threatened by Jesus. And yet there are so many who stay away from Jesus because we're ashamed of our sin, we're ashamed of our failures, and if we're honest, the church has often operated under the logic of negativity dominance, right? We, we've often been paranoid about uncleanness, and so we face sin with judgment instead of mercy. But let us not fear, but instead show God's mercy, which cleanses. This is who we are called to be as the church Instead of keeping away from Jesus in shame, we should run to him with boldness, trusting that Jesus has the power to cleanse all that is unclean in our lives. Jesus has the power to forgive all of the sin in our lives. We should not shrink from him in shame but run toward him in grace. And this is precisely who the church should be, a place that welcomes with mercy rather than shunning with judgment. May we be that. See, this is what we see in this story. In this interaction between the man and Jesus, we see what it looks like to come to Jesus with all of our sin and all of our shame. There are two things I want to point out about this interaction that happens between them. First, Jesus asks the unclean spirit, what is your name? What is your name? And the spirit responds, legion for we are many. Legion is a word for a, a large unit of Roman soldiers, right? So they're in this Roman occupied territory, and he says, hey, I, I am legion, right? I, I'm like all of these. Look at the Decapolis, right? And so Jesus says, what is your name? That's, that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that I want to point out here is when the unclean spirit is cast out it immediately flees to this herd of unclean pigs who all rush away into the sea where they meet their demise. And these two parts of the story, I think, show us some essential parts of what it looks like to come to Jesus with our sin. These two things in the story, I think, give us an incredible picture of confession and repentance. Confession and repentance, two things we are called to as we come to Jesus. Let me say a little bit more about each of these. First, confession. You see, I, I love that Jesus asks this question, what is your name to the unclean spirit? Because as we come to Jesus, in our sins, with our own unclean spirits, he asks us the same thing. You see, confession is about naming 
your sin before Jesus. All of our sins have names. All of us have specific sins with specific names. And part of coming to Jesus is learning to confess those names, to confess those sins. The other day I was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who who wrote in the middle of the 20th century, and he wrote, it is precisely for the sake of this assurance that that, that confession is about admitting concrete sins. People usually justify themselves by making a general acknowledgement of sin. But, he writes, I experience the complete forlornness and corruption of human nature when I see my own specific sins. Otherwise, it might happen that I could still become a hypocrite, even while confessing to another Christian. And then God's comfort would continue to be remote from me. You see, and this Bonhoeffer is saying that we mustn't just confess generic sin, but we have to do the hard work of self-reflection so that we can name our specific sins before Jesus. This is how we present the unclean parts of our hearts and lives to Jesus to be cleansed. It's not just a general confession of sin, but confessing specific sins. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, we have to do some soul-searching and say, you know, Jesus, I have been proud. Cleanse me and make me humble. Jesus, I have been lustful. Cleanse me and make me pure. Jesus, I've been bitter. Cleanse me. Make me kind. Jesus, we have been judgmental. Cleanse us and make us merciful. Right? On and on it goes. We have to name our specific sins before Jesus in confession. And confession doesn't have to be some sort of formal thing where, you know, you go meet with a priest and so on and so forth. Confession literally means to call something what it is. The the prefix con means same, like the word conform, right? And then then the, the rest of the word fess means to speak, means to say something. So to confess to God means to say the same thing about something as God says about it. It means that we call sin, sin. We call it what it is. We name it for what it is. We confess to God. But, but it goes further than that. Not only do we call sin what it is, confession also means calling Jesus, who he is, son of the most high God. Right? As we come to Jesus, we confess our sins as sins, but we also confess Jesus as Lord. This is what confession means, but there's more. There's more to it because confession is only a starting point. In this story, we see the unclean spirit doing all of that, right? I mean, the unclean spirit accurately identifies Jesus, you know, oh, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you have to do with me, right? He he accurately confesses the name of Jesus, and he accurately names himself, we are legion, right? Right? This unclean spirit is great at confession, but after confession, there's repentance. And confession without repentance isn't really much of anything. We see what this looks like in the story. After being named, the legion of unclean spirits flee to the herd of the pigs who quickly run off the cliff and fall into the sea. 
You see, confession has to do with naming what is unclean. Repentance has to do with changing what is unclean. uh, Repentance is the stuff where life is actually transformed. This is what repentance is. Repentance means we need to throw some of the pigs in our lives out to sea. It means that, that some things need to stop. Some things need to go. We actually need to stop sinning and change our lives. This is what repentance is, but, but it's more than that. A, a lot of us think that repentance is, ju- is, you know, it's just not sinning, right? Repentance is just about not doing sin. But that's not really repentance by itself. It's really no different than what we saw at the beginning of this passage, whenever the people were trying to bolt down this man with shackles and chains. They tried to restrain it, but they couldn't. They failed. And any time that we try to restrain sin with our own power, we are also bound to fail. That's not repentance. That's legalism. Just trying to not sin, it's not repentance. That's just another way of of falling off the cliff yourself. Repentance is not just about not sinning. Again, I want to talk about what this word actually means. The word repent literally means to turn. It means to turn. It means turning away from sin, yes, but it also means turning toward Jesus. Repentance means turning away from shame and turning toward grace. This is what repentance means. It means pigs fleeing off of cliffs. It means no longer living in tombs. It means just like this man being in your right mind. Repentance is about transformation. And so confession and repentance are these these core parts of what it means to follow Jesus, to confess our sins, but to confess Jesus as Lord to repent of our sins, but but also to turn away from them and turn toward Jesus. That's the only way toward freedom. Now, I want to look at a couple more things in this story. Because at the very end of the story, there's a couple of very surprising reactions to what it is that Jesus has done. The first one is the people's response to what Jesus has done. Do you, do you see this uh, in, uh, sorry, my notes are not quite full here. Uh, the, the people see what is done. Uh, in, in verse 15, it says, They came to Jesus, they saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. And, and so they have witnessed a miracle. Right? They have seen this man who formerly was causing all kinds of craziness to happen. This man who was constantly harming himself and others. And they now come to him and they see him sitting, clothed in his right mind. And how do you expect them to respond? Wow, that's amazing. But that's not what they do. Instead... They begin telling Jesus in verse 17, Hey, can you get out of here? Can you leave our neighborhood? We're not comfortable with what's going on here. And I think that's the root of what's going on with this people. Is they want comfort. Right? This, this demon-possessed man was disrupting their life. And so they tried to shackle him in the tombs. And then Jesus comes and disrupts their life in a whole different way. But they also want him gone. And I wonder how often we just don't want to be disrupted. You know, we we try to shackle things that bother us. But then if Jesus actually breaks into our life and starts saying, hey, there's an opportunity for healing. There's an opportunity for real transformation. Well, that also makes us a little uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. 
How do we welcome the transformation that Jesus brings, even when it makes us uncomfortable, especially when it makes us uncomfortable? Right? Jesus is coming to disrupt our lives. He is coming to disrupt all these things that are unclean and show us a new way. There's another response that we see that's pretty surprising. You see, this man has been transformed, and he, at the end of the story, runs up to Jesus. In verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. And what do you expect Jesus to say, yeah, come on, let's go. But how does Jesus respond to him? He says, no, go home. Tell your friends and your family all that the Lord has done. You see, this shows us that when we follow Jesus, when we are disciples of Christ, sometimes we follow Jesus. Sometimes we are near to Jesus, right? Sometimes we come together for worship. We spend time reading scripture. We spend time in prayer. But also, part of following Jesus is being sent by Jesus. Jesus does not just want us to sit around in some spiritual bliss all the time. He is equipping us to be sent out. And this is what we do at the end of our service every day. This, the, you know, we speak words of benediction that sends us out into the rest of our week. Jesus wants us to be transformed by his presence, but he also calls us to be those who carry his presence and see the transformation he wants to be done in the world. And very likely, this man who had an unclean spirit becomes one of the very first missionaries to the Gentiles. He heads out into all the Decapolis, proclaiming all that the Lord had done for him. And people were amazed. See, Jesus not only calls us to follow him, but also sends us into the, the everyday work of our lives to bring transformation, to go into the places that we might consider to be unclean and trust that the power of Jesus can transform this. We don't need to live by the fear of negativity dominance because we know that the power of Christ prevails and brings transformation over all the world. This is what we see in this story. And so my prayer for us as we go from here today is that we would run to Jesus with confession and repentance. May we let the kingdom of God disrupt our lives. May we go wherever it is that he sends us. And may everything in us bow down at the great name of Jesus. Amen.